Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, you're watching another Wednesday episode of the Engine Room Pro Podcast brought to you by TokenMetrics.com. My name is Dylan Love, and we are joined today by Jacob Koch Gallup, our NFT whisperer. And we've also got a special guest. Kiefer is joining us today. Kiefer is the co-founder of Arcade Ventures. He also runs a pretty interesting Substack that we encourage you to check out. Go to flirtcheap.substack.com to see some of Kiefer's writing. Uh, Kiefer's newsletter basically covers fiscal policy in the U.S. Treasury markets and connects it to its larger effect in crypto. We're going to go deep on that in a little bit. But first, Jacob, we got to talk about this Fidelity report that sort of uh, lit up the crypto news cycle over the past 24 hours or so. Um, the secret's out. Fidelity uh, has discovered that Bitcoin is kind of cool, and they've issued a pretty powerful report to that effect. This is some straight up sailor flavored maximalism coming from a really old school financial institution fidelity controls hundreds of billions of dollars i know they certainly have quite a bit of my own money in a brokerage account and now suddenly there's this report saying hey this is cool and bitcoin probably should be considered distinct from other other altcoins uh what what do you think about this jacob and Kiefer, you're welcome to jump in as well yeah, so it's interesting because it's not just that Bitcoin should be considered distinct, but it's also they call it a superior form of money. And there was kind of um, maybe five reasons why Bitcoin was superior or better or should be considered different than all other cryptocurrencies. So first, they said it's understood best as a mon monetary good. And its primary investment thesis is that it's a store of value asset. And this makes it fundamentally different than any other digital asset because no other digital asset can uh, improve on Bitcoin as a monetary good. They said that Bitcoin is the most secure, decentralized, and sound digital money, and any improvement will necessarily face trade offs like losing some security, losing some decentralization, etc. That's like the, the age old. Uh, cryptocurrency trilemma but they also say that there's not a mutual ex ex exclusivity between bitcoin the bitcoin network and all other digital asset networks they just say that bitcoin is the monetary the number one monetary store of value and if you're valuing or looking at any other cryptocurrencies you have to look at them different than you look at bitcoin so let's play devil's advocate for just a second here, because how how much of this positive Bitcoin news is Fidelity really just seeing a buying opportunity? We've seen Bitcoin crash from all time highs in the 50, 60 range. I guess it's happened twice, maybe even a third time. Of course, it happened just recently. But if I'm running an organization like Fidelity, I'm probably thinking, ooh, this thing that used to cost 30,000 is now between, uh, excuse me, this thing that used to cost 60,000 is now between 30 and 40. How much of this is an opportunistic money grab? Yeah, I mean, th their last point was Bitcoin should be considered an entry point for traditional allocators looking to gain exposure in digital assets. So this kind of yell screams to me like, hey, you, the rest of our traditional finance buddies get in on this while it's hot. One thing you have to wonder is, um, is this maybe an alpha leak from Fidelity to themselves? Have they already positioned themselves in Bitcoin and now that they've got all that they want to own, are they now telling people, hey, it's time to buy Bitcoin? Because if they wanted to buy it and they hadn't bought it yet, I don't think they'd be out here telling everyone that this is the superior money yet because then they'd be competing with everybody else trying to buy in. I think they're in and they're letting us know they've got their position set. And maybe this is a, a you know, a coded message to some of their competitors. Well, yeah, Kiefer, I wonder, the, the, this Fidelity news really seems to touch a lot of stuff that you're actually talking about and writing about in terms of how crypto affects the big picture economy and legacy markets in general. Why do you think, uh, why, why isn't this news coming sooner? Is uh, w Other than a potential alpha leak, why is now the time for a large company like Fidelity to say, hey, this is a thing and we're going to jump into it? Um. You know, it's tough to answer how Fidelity might be slowly getting their toes into the water here. Because um, if Fidelity has an interest in crypto, which I, I presume most major financial entities do at this point, uh, they can't jump into any alternate layer ones, no matter how much they might think they're valuable. 
Uh, they can't jump into, maybe they can jump into ETH, um, but Bitcoin is probably the easiest one for them to sell and get approvals at the internal level. And, um, you know, they might have spent a good chunk of last year doing a good bit of research. And, uh, you know, maybe at this point in time, they've slowly managed to accumulate enough to really start saying this. Um, I, I don't believe Fidelity is looking at this at the, the larger macro level in terms of um, the Federal Reserve and the narrative between the, the Treasury markets and the bond markets. Uh, I, I think this is more of just uh, a decision they've probably made maybe six months to a year ago, because, I mean, most larger companies move at that speed. And, uh, you know, now is the time when it just happens to be convenient for them based on their own internal bureaucratic processes and less of, uh, you know, timing the market decision on their part. Mm -hmm. uh, Kiefer, what, what do we need to know about Arcade Ventures? What can you tell us about this, uh, this upcoming DAO? What does it mean to have a DAO that's attached to a venture capital firm? Well, Arcade Ventures is uh, an interesting project. And just for people who aren't aware uh, at the moment, uh, when a lot of layer one protocols launch, um, they need to attract users and they also need to attract dApps, but it's tough to attract one without the other. Um, so usually you'll get a grant program from one of these layer ones. Um, there's been quite a few last year. Harmony One, there was 300 million grant announced in September. Uh, Avalanche, Phantom, um, Icon, you can keep going through different protocols and they're offering these grants for people to develop uh, develop, develop dApps or bring in liquidity, um, just anything to gain more users, more usage, more transactions. And uh, these can usually be a good pathway in for people who are wondering, like, how do I get paid to do this? How do I get noticed? How do I uh, start a proposal? And um, you know, there's community funding inside a lot of these different ventures, like uh, Terra Luna, for instance, um, yesterday or today, depending on uh, which part of the country you're in, uh, just um, put up for vote uh, within their own DAO for a $38 million um, spend uh, as a partnership um, with a major sports team here in the U.S., uh, within one of the big fours, either NBA, NFL, NHL, or MLB. Um, obviously for confidentiality reasons, they can't say, but like the, this is the scale of what can be done with a DAO. Um, you can propose something as small as, uh, would like to start a website, uh, would like to do advertising in my uh, local neighborhood and as large as, you know, buying a sponsorship with a major sports team and, you know, any idea you have, you can bring to these layer ones and what arcade ventures is intending to do is intending to be, um, you know, a go between for people who have great ideas, but don't quite know, you know, how do I make this grant proposal? How do I structure the grant proposal? How do I get uh, approval and backing um, at the, the community funding level within each one of these layer ones? Um, and, you know, our goal is to take advantage of some new grants that have launched um, in January um, that it's a grant that's multi-chain um, for anyone using an interoperability function. Uh, that's being launched by Icon ICX, um, and our goal is to help people get into the crypto economy and to start earning crypto, building in crypto, um, and just getting started. And that's that's our main goal there. Right on. Uh, I, I guess we're kind of asking some questions out of order here, but could could you talk a little bit about how you got uh, how you took your first steps into crypto? You to to use your own words, you described yourself as a degenerate investor. But I wonder if you could add a little more color on, on how you all got started with this. Um, you know, everyone in crypto has got that one friend that told them about it at one point or other in their life. And eventually they kind of uh, took the plunge or they are that friend. Maybe they, they can point mm -hmm. to a million different people they know they've gotten into it. Um, but yeah, I just happened to meet uh, some very intelligent people who got me to finally take a serious look at crypto. Um, back during like the, the doldrums of 2020 when, um, you know, the markets were in a real bear, um, which was a great time to get in. And, you know, um, I tend to find myself as a, a bit of a, I would say, self-taught in a lot of things. Um, prior to that, I'd been in um, the Forex markets, the COMEX markets, uh, the Treasury markets trading for like the past uh, five years prior to that. So, you know, bringing a lot of technical analysis, fundamental analysis to crypto 
and trying to get in, you quickly discover that there's a lot more to be made um, by using new dApps, finding new te technology, um, joining new launches, and um, you know, speaking with teams at the the level when they're launching and when they're whitelisting wallets, and not when you know you're hearing about it on Twitter or seeing it um, on Coin Market Cap or any other website. And you know, the further you go trying to make these connections and you know get get involved in launches early and earlier. Um, eventually, you start getting to the point where you know you're talking to people uh, within the actual foundation themselves and finding out what they actually need. You, you start seeing that there is some pretty significant needs for even just you know basic things and skills you might have in from the workforce, from whatever you did before, whatever you went to college for, and um, you know suddenly you find out that there's more to do than just. Um, joining a liquidity pool for three days and pulling as much money out of it as you can and then jumping to the next one. And that's been kind of my journey slowly as I'm, you know, you go from Bitcoin and Ethereum to looking at all sorts of small side chains. They're not small anymore. Um, like Phantom's grown significantly in the past uh, five yeah. or six months. Um, but, you know, that's where I went to avoid gas fees. And suddenly uh, I find myself, um, you know, learning and getting integrated with the, the people who are de designing these uh, dApps themselves. You mentioned so, the 2020 bear market as being a, an interesting and good time to get into this stuff. Do you see any parallels between the market at that time and the market in present day? Uh, yeah, actually, there's some pretty significant ones. Uh, I don't know how much I want to bore some of your listeners talking about. We got, um, a, we got a large audience of retail traders, so they'll be interested. Oh, perfect, perfect. Um, so the treasury bond markets are basically the price of money within the U.S. And a lot of people, whether they know it or not, they're trying to arbitrage, you know, the basics, food, shelter, energy and status by entering the markets and exiting, exiting the markets at the correct time. Um, and in the meantime, we've got the Federal Reserve, which is trying its best to make sure that um, you know, the U.S. government is able to fund itself, that there is also a wealth effect among most traders. So people are incentivized to go out and spend money and also to control inflation. And they do all of this through the Treasury markets as well. And um, right now we're heading up to a very interesting time period where, you know, the Fed is trying to taper, which is something I can explain at a later point here. Mm -hmm. um, they're trying to taper their asset purchases. Um, which is pulling liquidity out of the treasury markets, uh, the secondary treasury markets, which is affecting interest rates. Um, and so when the treasury itself wants to have auctions to fund the government, um, the amount of demand that's present in the secondary markets affects exactly how much people want to bid into the primary markets. And so the Federal Reserve is trying to juice the secondary markets so that people are incentivized to bid for our uh, to bid for our treasury bonds, but at the same time, there isn't any way for them to do that while balancing inflation. And so they're going to run into a very tough choice here in the next two or three months where we're going to find either the treasury markets are strained or inflation is going out of control or asset prices are going out. Asset prices are going out of control. And I don't think they're going to allow the treasury markets to uh, be constrained and risk you know, their ability to fund the government. And so I think we're going to see another repeat of, you know, some of the lows in March 2020 and some of the activity the Fed did. But I'm not sure when that's going to happen this year. Um, it could be a few months from now. It could be summer. So I'm, I'm dying to ask you, it's a problematically vague question, but please slice and dice it as best as you can. How does the U.S. government knowingly or unknowingly influence the price of, let's say, Bitcoin specifically? I'm talking about the crypto market at large, but let us if we have to talk about one thing, let's talk about Bitcoin price. To what extent are people consciously doing things at the government that change the price of Bitcoin? Well, I would say most of it is unconscious. I don't think they're intentionally trying to change the price of Bitcoin. Um, but, you know, as they... Um, so the more liquidity they end up pumping into the system, the more it kind of spreads around. So back in March 2020, um, the government was desperately trying to get people not to sell specific assets. When I say people, I really mean large institutions, mm -hmm. JP Morgan, Wells Fargo. Um, they didn't want them to keep selling stocks. They didn't want them to keep selling mortgage-backed securities. 
uh, they didn't want them to keep selling corporate bonds because the market was kind of in a tailspin. And so they opened up a desk where they were lending to these large banks um, a significant amount of money to the equivalent of however much they owned in a stock or corporate bond. So say the bank needed cash and the government says, we don't want you to sell your corporate bonds. We'll lend you the value of your corporate bond right now at a 0.25% interest rate if you hold it for 90 days or 120 days. And so, you know, on the one hand, this stopped people from selling, sorry, this stopped large entities from selling. And on the other hand, this also induced large entities to buy and then borrow against what they bought because um, it was essentially free money. And, you know, as that market starts getting juiced up, um, you know, the retail investors end up following suit because like, oh, hey, the stock market's bottomed, we're in. Um, and then when the stock market bottoms, this also leads to people speculating and buying a lot of other risk on assets and risk on would be something that um, something that you buy when you are uh, willing to speculate. It's not a flight to safety like um, uh, like treasury bonds or gold could be considered risk off assets because that's when people are more concerned about the state of the economy. Um, and so, you know, as as the Fed opened up these uh, lending desks to these banks, they end up inadvertently juicing most of the other uh, markets around them. They, you know, they juice the bank's appetite for mortgages because the banks can uh, basically borrow for free against these mortgage-backed securities. Um, they juice uh, bank appetites for corporate bonds, for stocks. And, you know, this all ends up flowing out into the larger markets. Um, and eventually we see that pump Bitcoin. And then the opposite happens, of course, uh, as they start closing these desks or retracting this liquidity. Mm -hmm. Jacob, what questions do we have for our man here? Yeah, I kind of want to go back to the grant proposals. So if I get the, am I getting this right that these layer ones are offering hundreds of millions of dollars to developers to create D apps on, on their, uh, native blockchain and these, these grant proposals, they're just, are they just giving them money? Are they taking equity in return or is it just like free for them to, as long as they have a good idea or a good project? Um, well, it's not free. And depending on which grant you look at, there's lots of different models. Um, for instance, if you look at Phantom, uh, their grant, um, it's paid out based on how much TVL is uh, locked up in TVL is, um, uh, you know, how much liquidity are they currently holding inside of the DAP. So what Phantom was mainly looking for were DeFi DAPs to launch um, because that's where you're going to get the most TVL. And so what they were doing is, hey, you launch your you launch your DAP, um, you show us how much liquidity you've got, you create your multi-sig wallet, and we will pay you out a certain amount based on how much liquidity you've locked up. And that um, amount of FTM, it's locked up for, I believe, 12 months, something along those lines. And so, you know, their goal was to create DeFi DAPs, and they've created a significant chunk of DeFi DAPs. Um, sometimes if you look at some of these other, um, protocol launches, it's for something completely different. Um, like the icon protocol, uh, sorry, the icon, um, grant that's launching, uh, that one is set for anyone who uses their wrapped assets that come out of their interoperability solution. So, um, you know, if you, um, set up a DeFi solution, or if you already have an existing DAP and you just add the wrapped assets. Um, you can get some additional rewards that will be paid out by ICON um, through your liquidity incentives. And so, you know, those additional rewards will attract additional TVL, which attracts uh, additional income for your DAP. Um, and some of these, it's just a straight payout. You make a proposal for what you would like to do, how much you think it should cost, um, and what the benefit you think would be provided to the layer one. And uh, usually these get voted on or not. Um, like Terra Luna has a voting system. Icon has a voting system. It refreshes every month. Um, and these are basically funded through uh, token burns um, and transaction fees. Um, so the transaction fees are usually collected and just added to a treasury fund. And um, you know, once a certain period, uh, you can vote on all of the, the new proposals that have come out. Um, so there's a lot of different types of proposals and a lot of different ways you can do this. Um, it really just depends on which layer one you're looking at, what the grant looks like at the moment. But there's a lot of them that are available for new people to hop into the space. I just want to quickly remind our audience that you are currently listening to or watching 
Uh, the Engine Room Podcast brought to you by TokenMetrics.com. Our guest today is Kiefer of Arcade Ventures. Kiefer, what can you tell us about this relationship between Arcade Ventures and something called Arcade Node? Can you make that clear for me at least? Sure, sure. And so for people who do visit the website, I know the website says Arcade Node. Um, and this one is, might go over some people's heads, but uh, it's... Uh, I, I, it's based on ICX, and ICX is a delegated proof of stake, which means um, that the nodes that are validating transactions um, have a governance role. And um, you know, as a node, you are able to sponsor certain projects or vote for certain projects that um, you, as uh, just an owner of the token, wouldn't be able to vote for. You know, you vote for someone. Sorry, you vote for a node, and the vote actually the node votes for projects and sponsors projects. So Arcade Node is the node, and Arcade Node is sponsoring Arcade Ventures, which is the the project for venture capital within uh, this grant ecosystem. Good deal. Uh, so where's your head at on the various narratives that have popped up within crypto investing over the past few months? I guess I'm thinking specifically about metaverse stuff. To what extent do you think this is the this is something that can take crypto more mainstream, crypto themes mainstream? Uh, you know, that's an interesting question. Uh, metaverse is kind of fascinating in a lot of different ways because it means so many different things to so many different people. You know, one hand, there's, you know, the Facebook integration where, you know, you're just interacting with what Meta has set up for you. And they've got a lot of great tools to build in. And on the other hand, it seems to mean almost any... Um, space within crypto that's uh, 3D or that's uh, DeFi gaming. Um, it's, it, it can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. And I, I found that, you know, there's a lot of interesting ways which in, within which, um, you know, crypto spaces can become, you know, public spaces where people interact with each other, uh, especially when we think about Web3 and uh, the way we can interact with almost pseudonymously with people in some of these 3D spaces. And, you know, crypto ends up being the obvious means of, um, it's the means of spending within this space. I, I think the means of transaction within these spaces. Um, it's far easier to sign transactions as payment within these spaces. And why not have a virtual shop? Why not have a, a virtual bank? Why not have a, a virtual museum where people can sign for these transactions? It almost doesn't make sense to be paying with a, a credit card in these spaces or a PayPal account. So I think crypto ends up uh, lining up very well with metaverse spaces. But, um, you know, when we speak meta in terms of Facebook, I'm not sure if crypto will line up in that same space or not. Um, I think they're trying, but uh, we'll see. It really depends on what people want to do. Yeah, I got I got a I love collecting interesting ideas about this stuff. And I got a good one the other day. So let me take an opportunity to quickly plug an upcoming interview landing on this YouTube channel on Sunday with Paul Budnitz, who's the CEO of a creative art NFT studio called uh, called Super Plastic. I asked him which of the various metaverse projects out there is going to win. You've got Sandbox, Decentraland, Facebook's meta thing that may or may not ever see the light of day. Quite my question to him was, which of these is going to win? And he says, none of them needs to win. It's all metaverse. These are just different destinations in the metaverse as opposed to one of them merging as the, the capital M metaverse. I kind of like that answer. I like this idea that there's room for everything. I don't know what you guys think. It's definitely an interesting answer. And one thing I do wonder is, you know, will these metaverses want to talk to each other? Um, will it be possible to have, say, a door in one that your avatar can walk up to, open the door and walk out in another metaverse? Um, you know, if they're willing to do things like that, then yeah, it almost doesn't matter who wins because, um, you know, it's about the social network, right? You want to have your friends all be within reach, right? So it's like, you know, PS4 and Xbox, um, you know, maybe 10 years ago, if you wanted to play video games online, it's like, which ones are my friends on? That's the one I'm buying. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I suspect it's the same with Metaverse. But if they can all talk to each other, that doesn't matter where your friends are. You can just walk over to them at any time. Um, so it'd be curious to see whether they want to take this opportunity for synergy to work together or if they're trying to corner the market for themselves. You know, it's an interesting question for how they might play that play out. 
I got I got one last question for you. I don't know if Jacob has anything else. Let me let me throw this out there before we say goodbye and wrap this thing up, Kiefer. Thanks for sharing your time with us, by the way. I know that it's early days for Arcade Ventures. I know that you are um, semi-secretly involved in, in getting some projects funded that you can't totally talk about right now. But my question is, if, if I run some crypto effort, if I'm running some crypto project, what's the right way to get your attention? And are you up for being pitched by people? <laughs> Uh, yeah, of course. And I, I get pitched more often than I expected to this early um, already. But yeah, it's easy to reach us at arcadenode.org. Um, that's the, the main spot. We're still working on getting socials up because this is still a very, very new venture. Um, but there is a, a form to fill out over there to reach out by email. And uh, we do respond. Um, and we can also share more information about the specific grants that we are working with to help people uh, get integrated if they want to develop any sort of projects. And we're open to almost any form of project that applies to blockchain. It's not just about developers. Um, you know, if you believe you have skills in marketing, if you believe you have skills in, um, you know, setting up a more open way for protocols to, you know, communicate to investors, if you believe you have any sort of anything that can apply to a crypto space, uh, don't be afraid to pitch it. You know, it's more than just developers. There's lots of room for everyone here. Jacob, anything before we wrap this thing up? No, I just want to say thank you for coming and sharing your great thoughts on, on our podcast. Yeah, much appreciated, Kiefer. Appreciate you being here. Sure. Thank you for your time. I really appreciate the invite. Right on, man. So let's wrap this thing up. You have just uh, listened and or watched another episode of the Engine Room Podcast by TokenMetrics.com. If you've watched this far, you might as well subscribe to this channel. Uh, give this video a like. If you want to watch our daily live stream, we've got our infamous Bill Noble, who helps you make sense of what's going on in this crazy market, doing live TA on demand for an hour a day live. Uh, hit that bell, get a notification when we go live. Stay subscribed and stay with us. We'll see you next time.